everybody. <laughs> um, if you are looking for, um, I don't know, a session about inclusive design, design accessibility kind of stuff, you're in the right place. Um, so uh, let's see. I like to start my talks off with a roadmap. So for today's content, um, I have um, an introduction moving into the importance of design. Next, we'll talk about designing with inclusivity in mind. Then we'll move into examples and wrap up with a conclusion. On my roadmap, items one and two are pretty close to the beginning. Three is kind of about at a third way point. Um, and then section four, which examples, which will be the bulk of my session, um, is kind of at the midpoint. And one second, I need to get rid of those. There we go. I see video. Um, awesome. OK, so before I jump into my content, I want to start off with an Indigenous land acknowledgement. Um, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that I am presenting to you today on the unceded ancestral lands of the first people of Seattle, uh, the Duwamish people, past and present, in honor with gratitude, the land itself, and the Duwamish tribe. If you are curious about the ancestral land that you are currently on, feel free to visit native-land.ca. That's N-A-T-I-V-E dash land, L-A-N-D dot C-A. Um, I also encourage you, um, if you, yeah, I know a lot of people are in Oklahoma, but if you're curious, um, uh, I you know, recommend the website Real Rent Duwamish. Um, from their website, Real Rent calls on people who live and work in Seattle to make rent payments to the Duwamish tribe. Though the city uh, named for the Duwamish leader, Chief Seattle, thrives, the tribe is yet to be justly, justly compensated for their lands, resources, and livelihood. Um, you can do something today to stand in solidarity with first peoples of this land by paying real rent. All funds go directly towards the Duwamish uh, tribal services to support the revival of the Duwamish culture and the vitality of the Duwamish tribe. All right, um, let's get going with introduction. So a little bit about me. My name is Shell Little. My gender pronouns are she, her. You can find me at Twitter at Shell E Little. Um, I am an accessibility specialist. I'm an inclusive designer and I am a professional speaker. I speak on disability, cognitive accessibility, accessible design, and also game accessibility. So um, as I'm sure you guessed, I live in Seattle. I am partnered and my kids all have tails and we actually just got a new kitten. So if you hear screaming or scrabbling in the background, uh, I explains it. So um, I'm an inclusive designer. I am a neurodivergent inclusive designer and I am also a disabled neurovergent inclusive designer. So those are words that uh, represent me and that I feel empowered to use. So um, just to give you a little bit of context of where I'm coming from with this presentation. So my session today will give you everything that you could possibly need to know about designing for accessibility and inclusivity. I'm totally kidding, that's impossible. <laughs> my session for today, my goals would be um, just to introduce some designers to some of the accessible inclusive design best practices. The content I'm gonna talk about today is not the end all be all. It is not even the most important stuff. It's just stuff that over the years of working in inclusive design, which has been about, I'm going on seven years now, um, things that I notice a lot, things that blow people away and things that not enough people think about or talk about. So um, my session is by no means all of it. I actually struggle to water down, condense, however you want to say, the wealth of knowledge that is, you know, both accessible design and inclusive design. So this is just a little, uh, I don't know, tidbit. Um, so we're going to start off with some boring content that I'm going to kind of run through. The goal is to get to the bulk of the presentation with enough time. 40 minutes is not a ton of time. I'd like to leave time for questions. So Defining design, which, you know, talking to developers, I know a lot of people who actually don't even know what design means. Um, you know, in the concept of, when we're talking about product design, um, the process of imagining, creating, and iterating products that solve users' problems or address specific needs in a given market. So a user has an issue, you make a product. Um, the key to successful product design is understanding the end user customer and the person for whom the product is being created. So it's very much about who it's being designed for. Um, so design, in my words, is any decision made about how a product should look visually, be structured, behave, and communicate with users. So if you are making any of those choices, congrats, you're doing design work. Um, design can be broken down into many different categories, many different you know, principles. But for me, the main roles when I think of design and you know, what I've worked with in the past is um, breaking it down into three, visual design, interaction design, and content design. 
Now, visual design is a person who's in charge of how the product looks visually, includes components are designed, spacing, alignment, styling of states, color usage, iconography, and anything else that would really change the visual appearance of the application of a product. And in simple terms, a visual designer is someone who's in charge of how does it look? Now, interaction design is the person who's in charge of what the product actually does. Um, they're responsible for taking users' needs and transforming them into elements and patterns. So a user has to do X so that we should put Y on the screen. Every interaction between the user and the product is an interaction designer's responsibility. They're responsible for how does it work? Content, uh, a very underrated and incredibly important piece when we talk about accessibility is the person who's in charge of what a product says. Content on the page is critical for users. Things like labels, headings, page titles, accessible names, error messages, informational messages, all of that needs to be worked out by a content writer. So the content writer answers, what does it say? On the screen right now, I have a very large, uh, chart um you know typically how teams can work is it's a visual designer interaction inclusive and content designer all four of those individuals or teams work together to create artifacts such as red line specs interaction rules accessibility specs and a copy deck and all of those together bundled up are you know what's considered design deliverables each in very important um, and you know a different unique piece of the puzzle so we're talking about, I've mentioned accessible and inclusive design. Let's give a quick definition. So accessible design, and this is, you know, this is what the Washington Dolt says. <laughs> I don't know if that's right. The Washington, uh, oh, do it. I'm like, Dolt, that doesn't look right. Do it. Uh, fantastic group uh, off of the University of Washington uh, here in Seattle. Great group. Um, can't believe I said Dolt, but here we are. It's early for me. <laughs> um, so design, like when we think about accessible design, it's a design process in which the needs of people with dis disabilities are specifically considered. So accessibility sometimes refers to the characteristics that you know products, services, and facilities can interpret be used by people with a variety of disabilities. So it's we're talking specifically about accessible design for disabled people. Um, you know, in my words, when we're designing specifically for disabled people, you know, typically we're referencing web content accessibility guidelines, you know, WCAG and other standards to make products as accessible as possible. But what accessible design is not, it is not something that's done without the input from disabled people. On the screen right now, I have a picture of the infamous ramp stairs. Um, they are the stairs where instead of making an accessible ramp, they decided to put the stairs inside the ramp. A lot of people call this a huge win for accessibility, but clearly all this says is that the architect never talked to a disabled person because <laughs> that is uh, dangerous and very poor, very poorly made. Uh, moving on to a quick definition of inclusive design, um, per Microsoft, it, uh, inclusive design is a methodology born out of digital environments that enables and draws on the full range of human diversity. Most importantly, this means including and learning from people with a wide range of perspectives. Now, in my, you know, when we're designing for all human diversity, you know, in my terms, you know, we're including not only just disability, although disability is a foundation of inclusive design, but we're also thinking about other factors such as race, gender, identity, sexual orientation, religion, socioeconomic standing. There's a lot of factors that can you know, leave someone out from the conversation. And inclusive design is moving a little bit further from just accessible design to including other factors in human diversity. So um, I have a chart on the screen right now. Um, a lot of times we think about you know, users in a bell graph and the famous inclusive design bell graph is where we start from the outside and work our way in. If someone with a disability, like someone who's paralyzed from the neck down is able to use your software, somebody who has no physical disabilities is likely gonna have access as well. So we you know, work from the out and in. So we are creating access by building for one and extending to many. So something can be accessible but still be not inclusive they're not you know full encompassing but i will be kind of using them interchangeably today uh you know it's they're just so close hang in there um i have a little chart on the screen where uh, you know accessible design it's a big piece um i have a pyramid where it has some gaps and i like to think that inclusive design fills those gaps so now um the little pyramid that i have built has uh, inclusive design filling those gaps awesome how are we doing on time Great, okay. Um, section two, told you guys it was gonna be fast. All right, the importance of design. 
So let's talk a little bit about disability statistics. So according to 2019 census data, people with cognitive disabilities, and let's remember, these numbers are always going to be underreported. So, and plus 2019 pre-COVID, with long COVID, the number of disabled individuals, you know, it's going up, especially with uh, generations aging into disability. That said, people with cognitive disabilities, uh, there is 15.8 million, hearing related disabilities, 11.5 million, um, mobility related disabilities, 20.8, and vision related disabilities, 7.5. That's a lot of people. When we talk about design, I like to focus on cognitive accessibility because accessibility for people with cognitive disabilities like myself, really, really lives inside of design. So when we think about how important design is, design isn't just for people with cognitive disabilities, don't get me wrong, but it is really important. So we think about the 15.8 million people, the number of people with cognitive disabilities that we know of from 2019 is around twice the population of New York City. So think of the bustling, you know, loud New York, double that. And that's how many people really need us to be thinking about design. And that's not even including all the other individuals with disabilities that need us to be thinking about design. Um, and that's not even mentioning the mental health crisis of the pandemic. I have a lot of stats on the screen right now, but, you know, four out of 10 adults have reported symptoms of anxiety, depression. You know, that's four times pre-pandemic. One fourth of mothers reported the pandemic has had a major impact on their mental health. 24% of parents reported being diagnosed with a mental health condition since the start of the pandemic. And things like anxiety, depression, and burnout are types of mental health related disabilities. So that number that we have, make it even bigger. All right, let's talk briefly about WCAG. Oh, WCAG, I have a love hate with WCAG. If anybody, if anybody knows me, you know, oh, WCAG. Um, but you know, if you think about accessible design, you're like, oh, accessible design, it's only color contrast. Then, boy, howdy, <laughs> are you in for a surprise? Um, to define the web accessibility, you know, web content accessibility guideline, WCAG, uh, WCAG, WCAG, you know, whatever you want to say, um, a set of guidelines organized by the W3C with the aim of making web content more accessible. I like to say that if you know. If it, like it's like a map, if your destination was pretty dang accessible, like you're not going to get all the way there, but you're going to get somewhere. On the screen right now, I have a breakdown. There are three levels, A, AA, AAA, and we have version 2.0 and now 2.1. So um, collectively, you know, we have, I don't know what to read off of this chart. It's just a large chart of numbers. Um, Total uh, WCAG 2.0 and 2.1, level A is 30 criterion, and double A we have 20, and triple A we have 28. Typically in the United States, we are focused on A and double A criterion. The reason why some are double A versus single A versus triple, it's just how hard is it to test? How reproducible is it? That, that's basically the main factor. So when I sat down and broke down WCAG a couple of years ago, I think this number has changed a little bit. Um, I asked myself, who would need to be in the room if a ticket for this WCAG criterion was entered in. And only 22% of those came out as like just dev, whereas 14% is both and 64% are design related. So you would need a designer in that room to answer how does this bug get fixed? So if over half of the criteria are design oriented, then why do we think of it less for accessibility compliance? We talk a lot about accessibility for devs and design, or like, and design's kind of like a lesser factor, but you know, that's why I'm here today. <laughs> so when we think about design criteria, again, I ask that question, who would need to be in the room? 15 uh, of the 37 criteria that are design would be uh, interaction design eight visual design and 14 content. And that really surprised me when I first did this, 14 content. So it goes to show how important content really is for accessibility. So compliance is the bare minimum and it still leaves out a lot of users. A lot of users are still excluded. But once the requirements are met, like once you understand the WCAG criteria and, and you know get the hang of them, then you're able to ask yourself about like users needs beyond standards. Like how can we push things past the standards? And for me, I think about accessible design as compliance and inclusive design is when we push past just base standards. Um, that's not how everybody sees it. I'm not asking you to see it that way. That's just how I view it. When I'm thinking about things where, well, that's not a WCAG criteria and yeah, I don't care. I don't, I don't just deal with accessibility. I am focused on how we can make experiences inclusive as well. 
Awesome. Um, designing with inclusivity in mind. Um, this is just a real quick, you know, run through. You don't have to have the standards memorized in order to start designing with, disabled, with disabilities in mind. All you really need to do is think about users and what their needs could be, and also talk to users uh, about what their needs could be. Um, there are four basic categories of disability, um, vision-related disability, hearing-related disabilities, um, we have mobility and dexterity, and then cognitive, so the, the ones that I broke down before earlier. So. When I'm thinking about vision, so these are kind of like me things. When we're talking about vision, we're talking about people who are blind, legally blind, they have low vision or color blindness. And when I think about those things, some important bullet points that I like to think about when I'm approaching a design is um, like component usage. Is this the correct thing under the hood? Will a screen reader user understand what the heck this is? Or is it a Frankenstein component? Um, do things have accessible names? Are, is the navigation consistent? Are things in a logical order? Um, is there clear instructions for someone who you know, can't see the screen to parse out what's happening? Um, is there enough color contrast for those who are low vision? How is color being used and being portrayed? And then you know, are we thinking about things like screen magnification? For those who are hearing, I personally don't work a lot in multimedia, so um, the list is a little bit shorter, but it doesn't mean it's any less important. Um, those are things like captions, transcripts, things like sound settings, and access to um, ASL interpreting. So there are lots of important things, uh, just less so on static websites without audio. Um, and we're talking about physical disabilities. We're talking about people who, um, you know, chronic pain, CP, muscular dystrophy, um, like a lot of different disabilities that I myself have been having a fun time with this past couple of years. So um, I'm asking myself, like, how can we avoid pain in users? You know, do we have things like bypass blocks? Are there big enough touch targets for people with low dexterity? Um, we're thinking about keyboard usage, people who are using alternative mice, um, people who are, you know, we're thinking about alt gestures, like is it, we can't just have swipes. We need to have other things for people who have low dexterity. Um, things like motion actuation, like are users required to swing their phone around? And orientation freedom. Does someone have a mounted device that's always in landscape mode? And then finally for cognitive, that's people um, with autism, people who have ADHD, dyslexia, uh, TBIs, Tourette syndrome. I'm thinking about things like motion, simplified language, working memory, captions or transcripts, really important for language processing, simplified workflows, communications of state, identi identifying the inputs, and dark mode. So those are just some quick, you know, high level things um, before we jump into the next section, which I can actually slow down and take a little more time with now that I'm doing pretty okay, um, which would be examples. So how I did this section is I kind of broke it down by you know, the three different categories of design that I'm thinking of. Um, what we're going to do from there is just talk about some high level stuff. Um, might, maybe this is new, maybe it's not. Um, but like I said earlier, this is kind of what I think of when I'm tackling products and trying to see, you know, what decisions can be made. So let's start off with visual design. So visual design focuses on how things should look but it's not just color contrast. I know people oftentimes have a lot of conversations and while color contrast is really important, it's not the most important thing when it comes to color. Or I should say it's not the only thing when it comes to color. So some high level focus points uh, are you know, non-text communications. So things like color, icons, images of text. How are we visually representing information to show to the user? Then things like page structure, like how is this is set together? How is spacing? How are fonts? Things like reflow and orientation changes. Um, you know, you as a somebody as a visual designer is responsible for those red lines. So how far away? How many pixels between X and Y? What happens when we hit a smaller break point? What, how does it collapse? How are things wrapping appropriately? Those are really important things because if something breaks on a, on a mobile device, that is an accessibility and inclusivity problem. Um, we know people who are, you know, unfortunately in this country, we have a lot of people who can't afford uh, to have computers and their cell phone is their only means to connect to the internet. Um, and when we have, when we're only thinking about people who use desktops, we're leaving out a marginalized group of people who unfortunately cannot afford because they were not given opportunities that everybody else has been given um, to be able to have laptops and computers. Um, so it's important to think about, you know, not just accessibility, but when we think about inclusivity, it's also about socioeconomic standing and barriers in that regard too. 
So let's talk about use of color. Um, color is great to use on a website and you know on applications, but it cannot be used alone to communicate information. So questions that I like to ask myself are, if this page was grayscale, does the information still get communicated to the user? So you have a wireframe, imagine it grayscale or have it be grayscale. Is that information still being communicated? So for my first example, let's talk about color being used as a form to communicate state. On the screen right now, I have a progress stepper. So right now, which I have seen this in the wild, <laughs> green, uh, I have a green number one, an orange number two, and a red number three. Green is to indicate the user has already visited. Orange is to show that's where the user currently is, and red is where users have not yet visited. Now, comically enough, <laughs> red and green are super important, but they are the most likely for someone to not be able to perceive when it comes to color blindness. So an alternative to color alone is shape. So a second example is they're all purple. I don't, I have a lot of issues with state. I could give a whole talk on, on progress steppers alone. I did a lot of research and a lot of work on them. But an example um, to show state is we have not only are all, they're all the same color, but the one that has yet to be visited is inverted um, and lighter. Items one and two are now bolded, so it's a change in shape. And to say what a user has is currently on, there's a ring around the um, or, you know the center number two. Uh, that way, I, it's really easy to tell when you swing your face past it if you are sighted. It's easy to tell where you currently are. So color alone should not be used, but it doesn't mean you can't use color. And okay, and if you want to do use color, just pair it with an icon, an icon that makes sense. But you can also use iconography to still stick with color. All right, on to use of color uh, actionability. So when we talk about underline your links, underline like I'm so blue in the face from telling people to underline their links. It's not because there's a standard to underline your links. It's because when you have black text and blue text, not everybody can perceive that. On the screen right now, I have a big chunk of text. It, it, it is cat ipsum, um, if you want to enjoy yourself with that. Um, but I have a brain injury and run a red light filter. When my red light filter is running, which I'm simulating now on the screen, I, it is really hard to tell what is blue and what is black. So by now underlining, and I have now underlined the three links, it doesn't matter that I have a red light filter running, I can now tell what links. So the you know rule of thumb for links is if the text is in proximity with text, it could be confused to be non-actionable. So if it's in a sentence, if it's next to another button, that's just an underlined thing, that's another story. But if it's in context with other non-actionable text, underline it. Um, next, consistent identification. After picking the meaning of an icon, use it consistently. Like the questions I ask myself are, are these icons serving a purpose or are they just extra systems for the user to memorize? Especially icons with no labels, which stink. Um, for example, error icons. If you're gonna use an X, use an X. If you're gonna use an exclamation mark triangle, use it. If you're gonna communicate to a user what something means, stay consistent. And that's, that is true across multiple pages as well, because I have seen, oh, well, this means error here, but it means warning there. Uh -uh. If you use it once, it's done forever. It has that associated, you know, consistent terming. Awesome. Next, required fields. There's more than one way to show a required field. Some people do the model of an asterisk, and some people use the model of only saying what is optional and assuming everything else is required. Both of those are fine. Obviously, programmatically under the hood, all of the elements need to also be set to be required as well. But, you know, decide the method you're going to use and just stick to it. Consistent identification, it's pretty simple. You just have to be consistent. <laughs> uh, and then, um, Last but not least for this section is uh, the Gestalt principles and specifically the proximity. Um, so items that are re like relevant should be in proximity with each other to retain their meaning. So the question I ask myself is, can a user scan this page and tell easily what content is related? On the screen right now, I have an example of a radio button group, but they're spread out far across the page. So by the time you get to voicemail, which is the last option, we've got contact preferences, text, email, voicemail. By the time you get to voicemail, I can't 
it's not in proximity anymore of what you're asking. So if someone, so for example, who's using a, a Zoom mag, like a Zoom or a screen magnifier, if they're zoomed in on voicemail, they have no idea what they're at anymore. And if you tie in cognitive, you know, working memory, uh, you know, that could be an issue. So below it, I have a better example of, I have contact preferences and then I have text, email, voicemail. They're on top of each other. It's, it's you know, top down rather than spread across. It's also great too, because it doesn't matter if you're on a giant screen or a little screen, they're ready to go. They don't have to break. And then you have to worry about, you know, what it looks like at different orientations. Cool. All right, um, interaction design. So interaction design focuses on how things work and puts an emphasis on proper component usage. Now, I used to, in a previous life, um, be the inclusive design lead of a design system for a large corporate entity. Um, so I'm a big nerd when it comes to design systems and components. So for me, interaction design means a lot about what's being used, what patterns are being used. Um, to someone else, interaction design might seem, mean something a little different in the context of accessibility. But for me, I'm constantly, what does it do? What does that do? What happens when I click that? What happens when I select that? What happens, what happens? Knowing the answers to those questions. So. High level focus points would be page structure. So limiting CTAs or calls to attention. So, you know, how many things can a user do on one page? Things like focus order. Does it make sense? How a user would, would access something? If you expand a section, does it stay focus stay within that expanded section before moving on to the next? Motion, how is how are micro interactions uh, being handled? How are sliders being handled other than thrown away? Because that's how sliders should be handled. They should just be trash. Um, and things like user needs, which is um, component usage, like I mentioned before, super important. And uh, things like timeouts. So uh, one thing I like to think about is uh, ease of use and preventing scavenger hunts, as I call them. So use patterns and components that will reduce the amount of time and effort users are left searching. And when you think about searching a page, oftentimes you think about scrolling, and um, we're talking about pain at that point, or if someone's a keyboard only user and they're tab, tab, tabbing, that's why we have things like bypass blocks or skip to link, uh, skip to content links because every click can hurt. Um, so when thinking about preventing scavenger hunts, I think about you know, the questions I ask are, is there a way I could reduce a user's pain by making this content easier to access? That also includes having less questions on forms instead of having tons and tons and tons of content give your users more pages with less content. So um, talking about scavenger hunt scrolling, um, I have a select component expanded. It's county, and I just have Washington counties. Um, there's a lot of counties in the state of Washington. So if a user wanted to get to the Ws, they're going to have to scroll all the way to the bottom. So anything that's kind of past 10 elements in a select component, that's where I recommend moving over to an autocomplete component or a component where a user can type in and narrow their search. So in the second example, I have a W typed in. So we're gonna get everything that has a W in it. So we have two and then we have the ones that start with W. Um, it's important to help users narrow their search. It's also, a, you know, there's a lot of screen reader stuff to think about as well in terms of timing and announcements. But in general, for thinking about making things easier for users, taking large chunks of information and trying to make it more palatable. This is a great reason to also use pagination. So some users think about shopping sites. They don't want to see 600 items on one page. Um, they want to see 10. But some users do want to see 600 on a page. So giving the users the options and freedom to change the pagination of a table, for example, or you know, a search result, really important stuff. Uh, primary CTA. So primary calls to action. Uh, when I say a primary CTA in terms of a form, we're, we're talking about the submit, the continue. So nothing's worse than getting to the bottom of a form and finding the dreaded disabled submit button. I have a disabled submit button that says you suck at forms because that's what I feel like when I get to the bottom. So making sure that we keep those enabled and appropriately allow a user to select that button so we can hit them with the errors that we may have missed in error validation that was server side. Say we have, uh, or front end. So say we have back end server validation, uh, those can be rendered to the user. So don't make your users scroll back up to the top and attempt to scavenger hunt for that one error, that one thing they missed. Um, so keep your primary CTA enabled. 
um, you know, when it comes to UA content, which is user assistance content. If there's content or help information that's needed, be sure it's put in proximity to the related elements. Don't make a user hunt for help information. If you know through user research that a lot of people are confused what an account pin is or, you know, X, Y, Z, make sure that the help information is right there in proximity and not tucked away in like a, you know, dusty help area. Um, cool, moving on to proper component usage. So correct use of a component and their pattern is critical when user input is required. Um, I ask myself when I'm trying to design something, you know, was this component I'm trying to use made for this situation or is there a better one? Am I actually using the correct, you know, concept or are we just creating something quite cursed? Um, components are like puzzle pieces. Uh, you can put them together, but you aren't guaranteed a picture if accessibility isn't thought of in terms of patterns, in, ter in terms of large groupings. So, um, oh goodness, okay. Um, proper component usage in terms of a select. So right now I have a toggle on the screen right now, and we are toggling between dollar signs or percentage. And a user can toggle back and forth between those two. Now, the problem with this is toggles, I like to call them sexy checkboxes. That's it, that's all they are. Under the hood of a toggle, it's just a checkbox. So when you ask a user two non-mutually exclusive, non-binary things, it doesn't make sense in the terms of a checkbox. So if I check it, it's percentages, but if I uncheck it, it's dollar signs, that doesn't make sense. Toggle switches and checkboxes are for on, off, yes, no, locked, unlocked. So the only difference between a checkbox and a toggle would be instantaneousness. So like if you have a setting in your phone, for example, a toggle is immediately working. You don't have to scroll to the bottom and, and select save. Um, they are instantaneous rather than a checkbox, which is then to be submitted later or saved later. So if you really want this percentage versus dollar signs, what you're looking for is a radio button group or sexy radio buttons, because there are two different items, but you could also have a third, I don't know, fractions, math. Um, there's not just on, off, yes, no. So under the hood, you've got two radio buttons. Would you like it to be shown in percentages or would you like it to be shown in dollar signs? That is the correct usage of that component. And you'd be surprised how often I see that done incorrectly. Something as simple as mutually exclusive, not mutually exclusive. So take the time to learn proper usage of components before you try and break the rules. Don't get me wrong, I've been a part of some really, really cursed product design for very specific needs, um, very niche specific things. We've had to make weird components, um, but knowing the foundations of those components is really important. So I recommend a resource is bbc.co.uk backslash gel. Um, gel is the BBC's uh, design system and framework. Um, a lot of wonderful humans that I personally love have worked on it. If you're looking to get access to an open source, that's a great place to start. They've got wonderful guides and tons of information to get to know because I can't, I mean, I could, like I said, I could give a whole talk on proper component usage, but I recommend you check that out. Uh, next up, timing adjustable. And speaking of timing, I think I'm running a little bit low on time, so I'm just going to keep moving forward. Um, if users absolutely must be put in time constraints, which don't do it, just don't do it. If at all costs, don't do it. But if they must be, they have to be oh, like, you have to allow those who need to extend it the ability to do so. So what I ask myself when it comes to time constraints is, is this time constraint really needed? What is the amount of time a user really needs? Like not how much security says you should do, not how much has been done in the past. You with your user group, how much is really needed? And that's a question of, um, you know, what's being asked of the user? Um, is it an input? versus something like you have X amount of time to get through this before your tickets are, you know, thrown to the wolves. Um, it's a lot of great, you know, important questions to ask yourself. And I have found that nine times out of 10, timers are not needed. They're just old and people want to keep redoing the same systems over and over and over. They've been around for a long time. Like it's an old antiquated, um, you know, wireframe that already exists and we're just going to push it forward. But we don't really need timers. For example, I, I don't have this in here, but um, resend code. You can just say, if you don't get a code in three minutes, try again. Like you don't need to have a countdown timer and then disable the button and then only enable it when the timer runs down. Like just tell people if you don't get a code within a certain amount of time, you know, 
it's not a new thing. Codes aren't a new thing. So, you know, make sure to say if you get a new code, it will make your previous one obsolete. But um, in general, you know, they're not really always needed. So things like session timeouts are a great example um, when you're on like government websites or, you know, anything that has secure information. The basic rule from WCAG is if a timer is not 20 hours or more or essential, users must have the ability to extend the time at least 10 times with at least 20 second warning. So, hi, we kicked you out, <laughs> suck it, <laughs> is not a session timeout. A session timeout is something that will pop up with at least 20 seconds. I prefer 30 seconds of a warning to say, you know, your session will soon expire, or I prefer to say your session will expire in 30 seconds. Does it need a, a countdown? Absolutely not. No, my God, no. Uh, your user shouldn't be losing information anyway. That's that's a back end. That's a system processing problem. But um, would you like to extend your session and then allow users to extend? Typically, click anywhere, move your mouse uh, will work as well. Um, but session timeouts, like for example, working on photo capture, we had a huge discussion forever <laughs> about if a camera should time out. Well, what about batteries? And I went on the record and said, I don't give a crap about people's batteries. If you don't have a screen timeout on your phone, that's your problem. We're not going to build in a timer that's going to kick people out of inactivity if they're not using, like, say, you know, check capture, receipt capture kind of products. We're not going to kick people out. Um, that's up for them because there's you're thinking, but that's a lot of timers to be tracking. Like, has a user touched the screen within 20 seconds? That's a lot of things to ask. It's just easier to let users be. Awesome. Moving on to content design. And I am running over, which is it's totally fine. Um, high level focus points for uh, content is things like page structure, headings, instructions, labels, uh, user needs, UA, excuse me, UA content, uh, inclusive language. So page structure, headings are a great way to give a map to the page. You know, it structures things and it helps people, you know, know where they're going, but also make sure to follow appropriate rules. Only one H1, there should be an H1, um, and then make sure it falls logically. Think of your website like a paper. You wouldn't want to have a random, you know, H2 out of nowhere without an H1. So I ask myself things like, is the information on this page, including user input elements, grouped in a way that makes it understandable? So using headings or labels, you can create structure um, by grouping questions and using uh, labels. So on the screen right now, I have a contact us form and name is a, a heading. And then underneath it, we have first and last address, all of the address information. So it's easy for a user who is cited to be able to parse through and tell what is grouped with what. Um, preventing and communicating errors. Um, a form is a conversation between you and your user communicating instructions, requirements, and errors. It's critical to in, you know, reduce the likelihood of errors or repeat errors. So questions I ask myself would be, are there requirements the user should be aware of before interacting with this form element? If they do trigger an error, is it clear how they should go about fixing it? So labels or instructions, give the user clear instructions on, to help them succeed. So things like enter account number, instead of just saying account number, uh, you know, that's not very helpful to the user versus enter account number or saying account number and then giving the format it has to be in XX dash XXX dash XX dash XX. Don't do that, but if, if it has to be that way, um, make sure, you know, if you put it in place, you must communicate it in terms of rules and logic. Um, error identification. If an input error is automatically detected, you have to indicate the error um, is described in text and it has to be a useful error. Um, you know, accounts must only be eight digits long. So you're telling a user you have exceeded by one. Um, next, error suggestion. Be sure that the error text is helpful and it doesn't remove instructions. So if it has like a requirement of format and then you say, oh wait, your field is required, their format's gone now. So you just replaced a really helpful hint message with a very unhelpful um, and not complete error message. So make sure you're thinking about those. Um, and then last for this section is uh, give users instructions. So if errors are found, be sure to send the user a helpful message. So this page contains five or more errors. Um, please fix the six errors before continuing to the next page. Um, things that are helpful, not just there was a problem. That's the worst. 
Awesome. Accessible name. Elements are required to have a name that are not, it's not only logical, but also reflects the text shown visually. I ask myself the question, do all elements have good titles to be used for their accessible label? Are there labels that are hidden that should be shown? Sometimes I find where they'll hide an H2 and I'm like, why are you hiding that? Yes, it's important for screen reader users, but it's also important for users with cognitive disabilities. Um, so repeat elements. I have a very blurry table on the screen, but it has multiple columns that all have the same similar button like add 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 delete 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 change 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 this is from a cursed wireframe do not judge it it is purposely bad if you notice things that are bad about it it's just a table with information in it um, in an instance where buttons say the same thing be sure they are referenced to the unique identifier in the table so it should say things like add you know to, to account tony or add or delete account alex um, by referencing the unique identifier of it. And yes, I'm aware that Alex and the <laughs> number is in the same column, ignore that. Um, same thing when you're using uh, you know, different accounts. So when buttons are repeated, be sure they're labeled associated with the correct information. So I have a username, Alex, the type of phone they have and their number, and you have the options to lock or delete. Make sure that it says delete user Alex and lock user Corey, not just lock, 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 delete, delete, delete. Same thing goes when you're opening modals. Make sure the heading of your modal, instead of saying delete account, are you sure you want to delete this account, saying things like delete account Corey, because once a user has popped up a modal, they have, don't have access to the content behind. And if there's hundreds of items, make sure the modal that's open has a good label on it. Awesome. How are we doing on time? Okay, pretty okay. Conclusion. So in conclusion, uh, designer uh, design is any decision that affects the visual or functional makeup of a product. Design can be broken into the roles of visual, interaction, and content. Three, accessible and inclusive design work together to make products for everyone. Four, only 22% of WCAG criteria are devs' responsibility alone. So design plays a huge role in accessibility. Five, when we think of users' actual needs, it becomes easier to understand WCAG is just a starting point. It doesn't cover everything. Six, color plays a huge role in design, but it's more than just color contrast. Seven, when building in logic, put the user's needs first. If you're putting in conditional logic, if you're putting in rules uh, for error validation, be sure you put the user's needs first. Eight, learn the rules of component usage in order to create coherent pictures. Nine, forms are like a conversation you have with your user. Keep it simple. And last but not least, 10, hire, speak with, listen to, and pay disabled people for their time and expertise. Thank you so much. I've been shell a little, <laughs> um, and I'm ready to take questions for however much time we have left. Great. Hi, Shell. Uh, yeah, that was great information. Um, and we do have uh, quite a few questions in here. I don't know if we'll end up having time for, for all of them, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, again, we just wanna let everybody know, you know, if you do have questions, go ahead and, and put them into the Q&A. We may not get to answer them live, um, but you will still get entered in uh, for the prizes and everything, you know, that wouldn't be fair. So. Um, so starting off, we have a question from Kelly and uh, they ask, uh, can you explain uh, or uh, define uh, neurodivergent for those that may not understand that term? Yeah, absolutely. Um, neurodivergent is a term that is used to describe the difference in neural, I don't know, gosh, I, I normally have a slide that has this, but basically it is a, a term that is to empower those whose brains function a little bit differently than the societal standard of normal. Obviously normal is, you know, relative, but it is for people whose brains, uh, like people who have autism, people who have ADHD. Neurodiversity is a term used instead of the medical model to be you are broken. It is a way to embrace your difference and, and love you for yourself for who you are um, because of those differences. So um, unfortunately, that's the best I can do without my like definition slide, but it just is a term used oftentimes for people who have cognitive disabilities, but in you know very specific like epilepsy and um, people whose brains are just wired differently. That's kind of what I say about my brain. It's just wired differently and that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Uh, next, we have a question from uh, Jeanette and uh, they ask, what is the best guide um, or way uh, tools approaches uh, when designing interactions? Oh God. <laughs> um, if someone knows the answer to that, let me know. Um, I would say, um, first off, 
follow Eric Bailey on Twitter. Um, <laughs> now, there's a lot of really brilliant people who are doing inclusive design work um, and thinking about interaction design. Excuse me. Um, I know um, Anna Cook is uh, currently working on a book in that regard. Um, I will be working on uh, trainings that I would like to get out at some point. I am on burnout sabbatical right now. So I'm trying, I'm only speaking. Um, that's all I'm doing. Um, but right now, um, there's one person it's, I can never, ever, ever say her name correct. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna Google it right now on the spot. Uh, so it is um, Sherry Byron Haber, my God, I can never, I, I only read names, I don't say them out loud. Um, and if someone wants to throw that name into the chat, um, has really fantastic resources about inclusive design. And from my understanding, a lot about uh, interaction design. I have personally referenced Sherry's work before doing discovery on toast, for example, like how long should something be up for or not be up for. I have personally referenced Sherry's work before and I highly recommend it. Uh Allie asks, um, do you have suggestions for creating accessible content that is future proof for responsive design? Oh, future proof. Um, there's no such thing as future proof. Who knows? You know, I don't really know. No, um, I think people used to think about like design for mobile first. And we've seen that there's a lot of flaws in that. I think when it comes to responsiveness is it's tough because we've got reflow and we have Zoom, and we have a variety of different Zoom uh, criteria. And so when we, you know, back in back in my previous life, when we redid all of our components to be 2.1 compatible, we ran into a lot of issues. Like, for example, sticky um, sticky things like at the bottom of a page. When you zoom that in, like button bars, it gets it takes over the whole entire screen. So if you have a modal with a button bar in it, there goes your entire working content. Your, your user's got like a little, <laughs> a single line to scroll with. So it's really hard to say. Um, I think if you are designing a product that works with typical technology now, like I don't think phones are gonna get much smaller than they are now. Um, but also if you're designing with the Zoom criterion in mind and with Reflow in mind, I think that's a really great way to succeed. So, you know, you're zooming to over 300%, you are using small breakpoints. I think um, there's a lot better, I don't know, WCAG has all of the standards out there for it. I have, it's been a couple months since I've worked on that stuff, but I will say we found great success um, if we're thinking about things in cell phone size, whatever that is, thinking about what it is cell phone size when it's zoomed in. And that's a great principle of inclusive design. Like if, if someone who's using a Zoom on a mobile device, they have access to it, then laptops and computers and all other um, you know, larger screen devices, they're all set. So if you think about what's the hardest thing to solve for, it's smaller devices with zoomed in, larger text, especially if you're thinking about apps, like actual web, or excuse me, actual phone applications. If you have, you know, users have their font cranked all the way up, if it's not breaking, then you're in the clear. Uh, next, a question from Weston. Uh, do you have any resource links, uh, tips or tricks uh, to keep in mind when creating uh, promotional and informational graphics? Oh, graphics. Um, I will say last promotional and informational graphics. Um, my brain went to data visualization, which is not the same thing. Um, my best advice would be it can be made with CSS, so do it. Um, images of text is a WCAG criterion where basically it says, don't have giant infographs, don't have giant things. Um, that's just gonna require a wall of alt text. Um, ask yourself what is actually useful to the user. And if you find yourself writing a dissertation of an alt text for an image, it's not working. Um, so by, <clears throat> excuse me, you're still able to take a large infographic or something that's useful, but make it actually be real and not just an image um, by, you know, building with CSS and, uh, you know, actual paragraph text. Um, that way users can, for example, they can copy paste. Uh, what's also really important about doing that rather than images of text is websites that are built and, you know, not using images like that, they respect user settings for, you know, high contrast mode, which Eric just talked about, and things like um, what fonts you want to use. Some people have very specific CSS uh, styles on their own stuff in terms of like line spacing. So, you know, when it comes to promotional stuff, it's tough, you know, obviously I'm not an expert of promotional content in emails, but I know it can be done. I don't personally have good resources out there that I can rattle off right now, but I'm sure someone in the chat or on Twitter could absolutely help you find good resources for that. 
Great. Uh, I think we'll take uh, one more question here uh, from uh, Zachary. And uh, they ask, when talking about inclusive design, um, do you think adding your own experiences adds or takes away from the conversation? Uh, for example, uh, their experiences as a neurodivergent designer. Got it. Um, it's both ways. Um, when we think about privilege, it's important to recognize bias. I am a white woman, so that will always change the way that I view the world. Um, I'm also a queer individual, so that will change significantly the way that I see the world. And I think it is important to, in general, bring your whole self to what you do, um, but it, it's also critical to check your privilege, check your biases, because we're full of bias. And that's what's important to talk to people who, you know, don't look like you, don't believe what you believe, don't have the same lived experience. Um, I would say, I will never be not neurodiverse. So I will never be someone who designs without neurodiversity in the forefront. My lived experience shapes who I am. And to deny someone their lived experience is, you know, that's the same concept of being like, I'm colorblind. Like, no, someone's race and, you know, sexual orientation and gender identity shapes who they are as a person. So I wouldn't say you shouldn't bring yourself, but it's also important to recognize your own biases. Um, that's my best answer. I can rattle off this early in the morning. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Shell. And yeah. thank I you so believe... much, everybody. I really appreciate the time and enjoy the last session. <laughs>